Chapter 4 The Daily Grind The men in Alcatraz were the federal prison system's biggest troublemakers. Like Al Capone, they had bribed guards. Some had attempted to escape from other prisons. Some actually escaped, only to get caught again. They were sent to the rock to be set straight, to learn the rules, and to follow them. Inmates were on a schedule, which was planned out to the minute. While the schedule changed a bit over the years, it never varied in its strictness. According to the 1956 rulebook, every weekday, the inmates had to rise at 7 o'clock on the dock. They had to get their get dressed and make their beds and make sure their cells were neat and tidy. At 7.20, the inmates stood at their cell doors while the guards counted them. Security was extremely tight at Alcatraz. The guards counted the prisoners 11 more times each day. Sometimes there were extra counts. Guards dragged their nightsticks along the bars. They were listening for hollow spots where the iron wasn't strong enough. Inmates had to be quiet during counts. For the first few years Alcatraz was a federal prison, Warden Johnston had a rule of silence. Inmates weren't allowed to speak to one another except at mealtimes, quietly. This rule was eventually changed. By 7.30, it was chow time. When their row was called, the men walked silently, single file, to the mess hall, where breakfast was served to all the inmates at once. While Alcatraz had room for many additional prisoners, there were rarely more than 300 at a time. But that's still a lot of men to guard at once. And the mess hall could be a dangerous place. Riots broke out a few times a year. Often they started because of the meals. Food and water had to be delivered to Alcatraz by boat. Sometimes when the kitchen went over budget, or because of food rationing during World War II, prisoners got the same cheap meal for days in a row. When prisoners rioted, they threw food. They flipped tables and benches. They threatened guards. Forks and knives, steak bones, and even hot coffee became weapons. Officers on the outdoor catwalk overlooking the mess hall would order them to stand down. If things got even worse, 14 tear gas canisters in the ceiling could be set off by remote control. That's why the inmates sometimes called the mess hall the gas chamber. Food at Alcatraz. Despite mess hall riots, most people thought the food on Alcatraz was the best in the federal prison system. Guards and officers ate the same food the inmates did. Meals usually changed every day and included a soup, salad, or vegetable, a starch like potatoes, meat, and a dessert. Special meals were served on holidays and sometimes there was live music. After breakfast, inmates returned to their cells. If they were lucky enough to have a job, they would change into their work clothes and report for duty. Prisoners who didn't have jobs had to stay locked in their cells until lunchtime. Some jobs on Alcatraz paid the prisoners a small hourly wage. Other jobs reduced their sentences. That meant the more an inmate worked at his job, the less time he had to serve on the rock. On average, for every month they worked, inmates had their sentence reduced by two days. Warden Johnston believed in the importance of work and routine. He wanted to rehabilitate his prisoners. That meant he wanted them to leave Alcatraz better than when they came in and be less likely to commit more crimes. But inmates had to earn the right to work. According to Regulation 5 in the Alcatraz Rule Book, inmates were entitled to food, clothing, shelter, and medical attention. Anything else was a privilege. They had to show they deserved it. Having a job was definitely a privilege. It was a way to pass the time, to feel a little more normal. It also gave inmates the chance to learn new skills they could use after they left Alcatraz. Over the years, the prisoners of Alcatraz made gloves, brushes, brooms, office furniture, 
military uniforms, and rubber mats. They also did laundry for the military bases in the area. During World War II, they made buoys to hold nets that were dropped in San Francisco Bay to help protect the city from enemy submarines. Kitchen duty was considered one of the best jobs on Alcatraz. The hours were long, but the inmates could eat almost whenever they wanted. For everyone else, supper was served at 4.40. By 5.30, all inmates returned to their cells. For the next four hours, they could kick back and relax. Some painted pictures or read books from the library. They couldn't browse the shelves themselves. Books were brought to them on a rolling cart. Newspapers were not allowed. Others wrote letters. They were allowed to send two and receive seven every week. Each letter coming into and going out of Alcatraz was read by officers and censored. That meant anything the prisoner should not see or send was blacked out. Visiting hours. Inmates were allowed just one visitor per month. It could be his wife or a blood relative, no one else. And the warden had to approve the visit ahead of time. Visits lasted only two hours. Inmates spoke to their loved ones through bulletproof glass two inches thick. They were not allowed to discuss the inmates crime or current events in the outside world. They could not even discuss Alcatraz or its rules. Inmates could also play stringed instruments like guitars in their cells until seven o'clock, but singing or whistling was not allowed. There was an orchestra room where other instruments like pianos and drums could be played on the weekends. Al Capone played the banjo with the Rock Islanders, the Alcatraz band. In 1955, Radio jacks were installed in each inmate's cell. From 6 to 9.30, prisoners could plug in their headphones and quietly listen to radio programs. On October 4th, everyone was given the day off to tune into the World Series when the Brooklyn Dodgers beat their rivals, the New York Yankees. At 9.30, it was lights out. Inmates were told to sleep with their pillows on the bar side of the mattress. There would be three counts during the night. Kids on Alcatraz. Guards and officers have lived on the rock with their families since Alcatraz's day as a military prison. Most of them lived in a three-story apartment building that overlooked the dock. Not counting the inmates, about 300 people at a time lived on Alcatraz. People who grew up on Alcatraz say it was like living in a small town. There was a market and general store and a tiny post office. The officers club had a gym, a dance floor, a bowling alley, and a soda fountain. There was even a playground. But for many kids, the whole rock was a playground. They weren't allowed near the cell house, but they could still pretend. Instead of cops and robbers, kids played guards and comms. Convict is another word for prisoner. They made up stories about secret tunnels. Alcatraz kids went to school in San Francisco. Their school bus was a boat that made trips to and from the city. But even for guards and their families, there were rules. Folks visiting San Francisco had until 9 o'clock p.m. every weeknight, 11 o'clock on weekends, to catch the last boat back, or they would be stuck in town overnight. And toy knives and guns were not allowed. Kids used sticks and bananas instead. On weekends, inmates were allowed to sleep in for an extra 15 minutes. Church services were held on Sundays and religious holidays for those who wished to attend. And two Sundays a month, movies were shown in the auditorium. Saturdays and Sundays, inmates got a maximum of five hours in the yard. For most inmates, this was the highlight of the week. They played softball and handball. They smoked cigarettes and chatted on the steps. Sometimes spikes, fights broke out. Armed guards patrolled the scene from the 20-foot walls that surrounded the yard. Playing bridge and dominoes were also popular activities in the yard. Still, this free time was not enough to satisfy some inmates. Life in prison was unbearable. They wanted nothing short of freedom.